Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Moss Isley Space Cantina. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We better be cautious. Now, wait a second. Now, why in the world would I start a lecture on what is life by quoting Star Wars? Well, you know, other than Star Wars is my favorite movie of all time, and of course, that's a great scene. But the question is, you know, we're searching for alien life on other moons, and we've often wondered if we're going to ever find, you know, advanced civilization. And the question always comes down to, would we recognize alien life if we saw it? Or even more fundamental to that question, would we even recognize strange life on this planet if we found it? And I, I would like to think that the answer to that is, yeah, most likely we could recognize life if we saw it, if we encountered it, even if it was really strange. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, right? I'm saying that in the entire universe, that we would probably recognize life if we saw it. So why in the world would I be so bold? Do I lack imagination? Well, m maybe. But the reality is, if we can come up with a definition of life, or a criteria of life, or if we understand what makes something living, then I think we can recognize life anywhere in the universe, or even just on our planet. So, we often ask the question, what is life? You know, I prefer to ask the question, what does life do? Now that's subtly different, because if I'm asking what is life, then we're looking at life as though it's, um, it's something. Or if you say, what does life do? Then I'm saying life is an action. Life is a verb. Life does something. And that to me is a very subtle difference because if we can recognize those things that life does or the processes that life does or, or the processes that you do to be living, then I think we can apply that pretty broadly even if something looks really weird or is based on some pretty weird chemistry out there that we're not used to. So, what makes something living? What does life do? I mean, think about it, right? I mean, let's look at these organisms here. On this planet, there are millions of different species, and they range from the tiniest of bacteria to blue whales to colonies of plants or fungus that are enormous. So we can look at a coral, a shark, a passion flower, these things are all clearly living. They are not a rock. So the question is, what are these things doing that makes them living? And that's the question, right? What is a plant doing that makes it alive? What is a bacteria doing that makes it alive or an animal? So the idea is if we can come up with this set of criteria that we can apply across the board of what makes something living, of something that they're doing, then we can recognize it almost anywhere. And of course, here's a, a coral, another flower, and one of my favorite birds, a snowy plover. And these organisms are all doing something to be alive. So what might that be? Hmm, let's take a look here. Life creates order. This is so important. Life creates order. The universe, wants to go to high entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. The, the universe is grinding to a very stable, static state, is going toward equilibrium. That is not life. Life is a system out of equilibrium with this environment. Now, a system is a set of all these uh, interactions that take place around a confined boundary. And that confined boundary of a system for an animal or a plant or a cell could be a membrane or like my skin, this defines my system right here. I am a highly ordered system. Any living organism is highly ordered. We're not these random things that exist. So if you look at the sea anemone, a sea anemone or any animal that lives in water is highly organized compared to the water around it, right? Which is high entropy. And uh, we can think of life from a physics point of view. We could think of life as an island of low entropy. Now, to give you an example of entropy, just remember that's a measure of disorder. 
You ever not clean your room for a while? Clean your house, clean your kitchen, kind of gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. Yeah, as things get more and more messy, that's more and more entropy, right? That's disorder. And if you don't ever do anything, your whole world will go to high entropy, right? But if we start cleaning our dishes and putting them away, organizing our food, organizing our clothes and folding them and putting them away, we are reducing entropy. We are creating an ordered system. And life does exactly that. All life, not only does it create order, it requires energy to do so. So life extracts energy from its environment to create order. I mean, think about that. Life drinks energy from its environment. And that sets up some interesting things. One of those things are that life must interact with this environment as well to get ener energy. Without energy, I mean, there is no life. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Now, here's an interesting thing. You can microwave a jar of peanut butter. You can microwave your frozen pizza. Just because you microwave it and add energy to it doesn't gonna make it living, right? I mean, that's a that's a problem. Life has to be able to extract energy from the environment and then transform that energy into usable forms. And the way we do that is through a series of chemical reactions. And we call that our metabolism. And our metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in your body. You eat a pizza, you immediately start to break the proteins down, the fats, the carbohydrates. You break them down and your body extracts energy from those molecules. And as it breaks them down, it takes that energy and then it will build them up into the molecules, the proteins and the membranes that you need for your body. So your body does a lot of work, right? And uh, like I said, it extracts energy from the environment using metabolism. And that's why I've got a picture here of cellular respiration because all eukaryotic cells and most prokaryotes do, a lot, do some type of respiration where they take energy from the environment and they convert that to usable forms of energy. And of course, Eric Cartman is eating the medicinal fried chicken and he's eating the chicken skins off of it, of course, which has lots and lots of energy available to him. So he's being efficient about it. So because life needs energy, energy flows through life. Uh-oh, here comes another Star Wars reference. The force flows through a Jedi. Energy flows through life. So life has to have a constant supply of energy. So all life interacts with this environment to acquire energy. And as an animal, you and I, we have to eat. And of course, this of course is a Bothrops Asper eating a frog down in the tropics. I can't believe I saw that, it's pretty awesome. But he's eating that frog to get energy. And of course, plants are producers. They get their energy from sunlight and then they convert that energy into a usable form, which is carbohydrates for them. So we rely on these metabolic reactions. These some of all these chemical reactions that allow us to extract energy, break things down, use those building blocks, and build them back up. So you start to see life is pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, so another thing. You know, the world around us might be different. It might change. But life uses energy to create order. And in biology, we also have a process called homeostasis. Homeostasis is basically maintaining some type of internal environment that's different from the outside world. Now, here's an example. Every day, you are about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Drop that 98.6. That is wrong. I know. I know. If you Google it, it'll come up 98.6. We're not. There's a lot of variation, a couple of degrees every day. But the point that I'm trying to make here is this. We maintain a thermal homeostasis. If it's 100 degrees outside, we're trying to cool off and maintain about 98. We don't want to get overheated. If it's cold outside, it's winter time right now. It might be 30 degrees. We still have to maintain 98 degrees. And all living organisms maintain some type of internal environment that's different from the outside world. And um, life uses energy to do that. Now, a lot of definitions of life, or when people say, you know, what is life, or they talk about the characteristics of life, 
one thing that's almost universally accepted is that all these processes of life, most of these metabolic reactions that allow life to extract energy from the environment and then transform that energy into usable forms, those metabolic activities are directed by information on life on our planet. That is our DNA and our RNA. We store genetic information in our DNA that controls the day-to-day -day activities of all of our cells. And not only that, the DNA not only stores information to carry out the day-to-day -day activities of our metabolism, it also carries the information to direct our growth and development from a single-celled zygote, right? We all started off as one cell into an adult, right? That's pretty awesome. So DNA carries a lot of this information. And importantly, this information is heritable. It gets copied from one generation to the next. So as we copy this genetic information, we can make a new organism with it. And of course you can do it asexually, where you copy the information more or less identically, create an identical offspring, more or less, there's these mutations involved. Or like these horseshoe crabs that you see here, they can do it sexually. And sexual reproduction is where you take two genomes, one from the mom, one from the dad, and you put them together and you form a new offspring with that. So life reproduces, and this is vitally important. In fact, most definitions of life include reproduction. And the reason why reproduction is so important is because without reproduction, there would be no continuity of life. Life would spring up probably in some deep sea hot vent. And then if it never learned to reproduce, if it never evolved the ability to reproduce, it would just disappear again. So reproduction, like I said, it involves this continuity of life. Now, interestingly, this is kind of cool, and I'll probably bring this up again in future lectures, but because life is continuous, right? Life began on this earth about 3.8 billion years ago from one population of cells. You and me and everything you see are direct descendants of that original life. So think about this. Here's something to make you feel special today. You represent the end product of 3.8 billion years of continuous life. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, if you go back to your great, 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 great grandparent, or insert some billions of greats in there, and our ancestors were bacteria floating around in an ancient ocean, bacteria and archaeans to be exact. And uh, that's pretty amazing. You represent an unbroken lineage of life going all the way back to the very first cells on this planet 3.8 billion years ago. Well, you know what? Have you ever copied information? You know, every time you copy information, there's errors. I mean, you make mistakes, right? So does life. And amazingly, life is incredibly accurate at replicating the DNA, copying that heritable information from one generation to the next. But there are errors in it. You might have uh, three letters, C-A-T, right? And that's cat. And then all of a sudden, uh, a letter gets changed and you have T-A-T, tat, changes the meaning, right? Okay, so whenever life is reproducing, it represents small errors in the DNA. And that errors create change. And this change allows life to evolve over time. And, you know, over 3.8 billion years of our Earth history, life has gone from very primitive, single-celled prokaryotes into millions of species that we see today, like this Katie did. You know, the world is teeming with life. And every living organism on this planet, not only are they the end product of uh, 3.8 billion years of a continuous line of life, they are also the end product of 3.8 billion years of evolution. I know, that's just amazing, isn't it? So when most people like NASA are looking for signs of life, they're looking for the ability to reproduce and evolve over time. I like to expand that a little bit because for me, I think the most important thing for life is that life uses energy from the environment to create order 
by using metabolic reactions directed by information that can be copied to produce another organism. And that information by default does not get copied exactly the same every single time. And that allows for evolution. So evolution is actually a consequence of reproduction. So, you know, these are interesting things to think about life, right? I'm not trying to say there are these seven characteristics of life. I'm trying to get you to think of life as a process. Life does something. Life is creating order out of the universe, right? And it needs energy to do that. And then, of course, it can reproduce itself. And because it reproduces itself, it can evolve. So, you know, I started this off talking about Moss Eisley Cantina. And the reason why I started this talk off is, think about this. Luke walks in this cantina and he sees all these alien life forms. And the question is, would we recognize a life if we saw it? And that's not a, a completely like sci-fi question to be asking. You know, interestingly, biology and life may not be confined to Earth. And in fact, having this definition of life or knowing that life is a process can allow us to search for life on other places. We are in the process of sending uh, probes to moons of Jupiter, like Europa. We're looking for life on Mars. We're going to probably go back to Saturn and look on Enceladus. So what do you think? Would we be able to recognize alien life as we saw it? Well, are you on the not necessarily? Yes, because we have a good definition of life. You have no idea? Or it depends on how you define life. Well, like I said, I think we have a pretty good way of thinking of life as a process. So I would go with probably, yeah, I think we could. And I know, I'll admit, I might be lacking a little bit in my imagination. But based on what we know about uniformitarianism, the laws of physics and chemistry that operate on our planet right here today operate the same everywhere in the universe, right? In the past, the present, and the future. Hence, uniform. Uniformitarianism. Uniform means the same. And because chemistry, yeah, there could be some wild chemistry out there, it's still got to follow the same basic physical laws that it follows here on Earth. So yeah, I do think that we would be able to recognize life. It might look very different, but hey, that's why we want to go looking for it, right? Maybe it'll change my mind. Maybe we'll we'll find something that's completely different than what I thought. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this. This has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.